Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost of the One True God. Back with you with the next video in my series reading The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. Without further ado, returning to The Invisible Man as read by Lord Naren White. He rarely went abroad by daylight, but at twilight he would go out muffled up invisibly, whether the weather were cold or not and he chose the loneliest paths and those most overshadowed by trees and banks. His goggling spectacles and ghastly bandaged face under the penthouse of his hat came with a disagreeable suddenness out of the darkness upon one or two home-going laborers. And Teddy Henfrey, tumbling out of the scarlet coat one night at half-past nine, was scared shamefully by the stranger's skull-like head. He was walking hat in hand, lit by the sudden light of the opened inn door. Such children as saw him at nightfall dreamt of bogies, and it seemed doubtful whether he disliked boys more than they disliked him, or the reverse, but there was certainly a vivid enough dislike on either side. It was inevitable that a person of so remarkable an appearance and bearing should form a frequent topic in such a village as Ipping, Opinion was greatly divided about his occupation. Mrs. Hall was sensitive on the point. When questioned, she explained very carefully that he was an experimental investigator, going gingerly over the syllables as one who dreads pitfalls. When asked what an experimental investigator was, she would say with a touch of superiority that most educated people knew such things as that, and would thus explain that he discovered things. Her visitor had had an accident, she said, which temporarily discolored his hands and face. And, being of a sensitive disposition, he was averse to any public notice of the fact. Out of her hearing, there was a view largely entertained that he was a criminal trying to escape from justice by wrapping himself up so as to conceal himself altogether from the eye of the police. This idea sprang from the brain of Mr. Teddy Henfrey. No crime of any magnitude dating from the middle or end of February was known to have occurred. Elaborated in the imagination of Mr. Gold, the probationary assistant in the National School, this theory took the form that the stranger was an anarchist in disguise, preparing explosives, and he resolved to undertake such detective operations as his time permitted. These consisted, for the most part, in looking very hard at the stranger whenever they met, or in asking people who had never seen the stranger, leading questions about him. But he detected nothing. <laughs> Another school of opinion followed Mr. Fear inside, and either accepted the piebald view or some modification of it, as, for instance, Silas Durgan, who was heard to assert that if he chooses to show himself at, at fairs, he'd make his fortune in no time. And being a bit of a theologian, compared the stranger to the man with the one talent. Yet another view explained the entire matter by regarding the stranger as a harmless lunatic that had the advantage of accounting for everything straight away. Between these main groups, there were waverers and compromisers. Sussex folks have few superstitions, and it was only after the events of early April that the thought of the supernatural was first whispered in the village. Even then, it was only credited among the women folk. But whatever they thought of him, people in Ipping on the whole agreed in disliking him. His irritability, though it might have been comprehensible to an urban brain worker, was an amazing thing to these quiet Sussex villagers. The frantic gesticulations they surprised now and then, and uh, the headlong pace after nightfall that swept him upon round, quiet corners, and the inhuman bludgeoning of all tentative advances of curiosity, the taste for twilight that led to the closing of doors, the pulling down of blinds, the extinction of candles and lamps, who could agree with such goings-on? They drew aside as he passed down the village, and when he had gone by, young humorous would, up with coat collars, down with hat brims, and go pacing nervously after him in imitation of his occult bearing. There was a song popular at that time called The Bogeyman. Miss Statchel sang in the school of concert in the age of church lamps. 
And thereafter, whenever one or two of the villagers were gathered together, and the stranger appeared, a bar or so of this tune, more or less sharp or flat, was whistled in the midst of them. Also, belated little children would call, Bogeyman! after him, <laughs> and make off tremulously elated. Cus, the general practitioner, was devoured by curiosity. The bandages excited his professional interest. The report of the thousand and one bottles aroused his jealous regard. All through April and May, he coveted an opportunity of talking to the stranger at last towards Whiteson's side. Whiteson tied. He could stand it no longer, but hid upon the subscription list for a village nurse as an excuse. He was surprised to find that Mr. Hall did not know his guest's name. He give a name, said Mrs. Hall, an assertion which was quite unfounded. But I didn't rightly hear it. She thought it seemed so silly not to know the man's name. Gus rapped at the parlor door and entered. There was a fairly audible imprecation from within. Pardon my intrusion, said Gus. And then the door closed and cut Mrs. Hall off from the rest of the conversation. She could hear the murmur of voices for the next ten minutes, then a cry of surprise, stirring a stirring of feet, a chair flung aside, a bark of laughter, quick steps to the door, and Cuss appeared, his face white, his eyes staring over his shoulder. He left the door open behind him, and without looking at her, strode across the hall and went down the steps. And she heard his feet hurrying along the road. He carried his hat in his hand. She stood behind the door, looking at the open door of the parlor. Then she heard the stranger laughing quietly, and then his footsteps came across the room. She could not see his face where he stood. The parlor door slammed, and the place was silent again. Cuss went straight up the village to Bunting the vicar. Am I mad? Cuss began abruptly as he entered the shabby little study. Do I look like an insane person? What happened? said the vicar, putting the ammonite on the loose sheets of his forthcoming sermon. That chap at the inn. Well, give me something to drink, said Cuss, and he sat down. When his nerves had been studied by a glass of cheap sherry, the only drink the good vicar had available, he told him of the interview he had just had. Went in, he gasped, and began to demand a subscription for that nurse fund. He'd stuck his hands in his pockets as I came in, and he sat down lumpily in his chair. Sniffed. I told him I'd heard he took an interest in scientific things. He said yes, sniffed again, kept on sniffing all the time. Evidently recently caught an infernal cold. No wonder, wrapped up like that. I developed the nurse idea and all the while kept my eyes open. Bottles, chemicals everywhere, balance, test tubes and stands, and a smell of evening primrose. Would he subscribe? Said he'd consider it. Asked him point blank was he researching. Said he was a long research. Got quite cross. A damnable long research, said he, blowing the cork out, so to speak. Oh, said I, and I came, and, I, and out came the grievance. The man was just on the boil, and my question boiled him over. He had been given a prescription, most valuable prescription. What for, he wouldn't say. Was it medical? Damn you. What are you fishing after? I apologized. Dignified stuff and cough. He resumed. He'd read it. Five ingredients. Put it down. Turned his head. Draught of air from the window lifted like the paper. Swish, rustle. He was working in a room with an open fireplace, he said. Saw a flicker, and there was the prescription burning and lifting chimneyward. Rushed towards it just as it whisked up the chimney. So, just at that point, to illustrate his story, out came his arm. Well? We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual... I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please, like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.